but how many, oops, okay, brilliant. How many people work in a matrix environment? So world, large company, got to make good, absolutely great. So this presentation is for you. How are you going to be an entrepreneur in a highly resonating and matrix environment? My name is Maureen Allen and I work with Optum. Optum is a healthcare services agency. We are dedicated to making the healthcare system work well for everyone. At our heart, Optum is an innovation company. That's what we do. So I'm here today to talk to you about innovation and a project that I worked on. So as you think about being startup and you think about the environment that you work in, how are you going to actually be able to follow those principles? Follow the principles of customer discovery, customer validation, and building your MVP. What are going to be the resources that are going to be available to you? And then what are going to be the bumps in the road? So, Lee Startup talks about customer discovery, going out on the ground and finding your customers and talking to them and getting a sense of what they want from you. Lee Startup talks about customer validation. Are you really giving your customer what they want to the application and the service that they want. And then it talks about building a minimum viable product. So not a full scale application, but thinking about what you want to deliver and building the minimum viable entity that you can give to your consumer so they can evaluate what you're doing. So on my trajectory, I realized as I went out there to find my customers, that there were many bumps on the road. So I did what Eric suggested in his new startup book, like everybody else. I went out and I spoke to friends, family, co-workers. I went on internet disease forums. I looked at setting up an online website. In fact, I did set an online website. Um, I even thought about going to an adult daycare center because I really wanted to talk to people of a certain generation and I wanted to get their ideas around their healthcare. And then I spoke to, I, I um, placed advertisements on Google, and I also looked at Craigslist as a potential source for my consumers. Um, all of these are really good. Um, if you're in a regulated environment though, you have to think carefully about how you reach out to these people. So what were the barriers to my success when I did this? So the first thing you have to think about is timing. When I started my project, it was about a year ago, around this time of the year. And what are people thinking about when it comes to November, December, and January? Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve parties, they're not interested in talking about healthcare. So I found it very difficult to go out there and find those people. I had all those various um, uh, places that I was going to, but nobody really wanted to talk to me at that point. And then you also have to think about time of day. So, you know, Christmas shopping, going out to buy presents again. No one was available during the day, no one was available in the afternoon. I had to think about weekends. So time is really critical, and depending upon your industry, you really have to think about when do I go and find these people and how do I find them? The other thing you have to think about is networking. So when we're talking about customer discovery, I quickly found that my friends and family and co-workers were really good to talk to me, but they were uncomfortable. They were talking about sensitive information. If you think about banking and talking to people about their finances, you'll have the same reaction. And what I quickly learned is that it's important to network with those people to find second and third level contacts that I could use in order to get the information I needed to validate my ideas. So think about networking when you're in a regulated environment and the information you're dealing with is very sensitive. And then restrictions to online medical content. So this was new for me. So I put my Google Drive out there and Google wrote me back and said, sorry, you can't do this. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to get sensitive information and you don't know who you are. Um, so I had to rethink, how do I use the internet to get the people that I wanted? Because the information I needed was sensitive. And again, if you're in telecommunications, if you're in insurance, if you're in banking, you kind of face the same sort of restrictions that you really have to think about, how do I get to people online knowing that some of the content I want is restricted? And part of what I did was to be very general about the information I tried to collect. But in being very general, I found that I wasn't getting the people I wanted. So that was the trade-off, you know, having to go through a whole bunch of people to get to the core people that I needed in order to validate my, in order to get the consumers that I needed. And then the other thing I would suggest to you is that it's imperative that you think outside the corporate box. So when I first started to talk to people about finding my customers, they said to me, okay, well, market research is there, they can help you. 
the big book that I went to them, and I taught them about the people I wanted to find. And they think in terms of 200, 300 people. They think in terms of three to six months. I was talking about maybe 20 to 50 in two to three weeks. You know, so we weren't necessarily on the same scale. So I had to think about how do I actually do this in a way that would be consistent with the company, but actually got me out of those time frames. And essentially what I ended up having to do was speak to the people in marketing and learn what they did. Learn how do they find people, learn the kind of questions they ask, and then I found somebody who could get the people I wanted, and then I did the interviews, I collected the data, and I determined whether or not I was getting validation for my product. So you have to think of it a bit outside the corporate box if you really want to find your consumer. So you've got your consumer, you um, spoken to them, and now you want to validate your idea. And nothing new here, right? So you want to summarize that initial idea or concept. You want to validate it with the interviews that you have with these new potential customers. And then you want to update your thinking. Nothing new, right? You all know that. And what are the barriers to success? Well, no surprise here. Not truly validating your idea. I quickly learned that. I, I had an aha moment and I thought, wow, everybody's going to be excited by this. And as I talked to people, I realized they were interested, but not excited in the way that I was. And my idea wasn't really being validated in the way that I thought it would be. So I had to really rethink that. And that was very painful, I've got to tell you. I, I really cried a lot about whether or not my idea was going to work. And then not understanding the marketplace. So as you think about your environment and your customers, you really have to understand the market. Um, I started out with a perception of the demographics and the people I wanted to reach out to. As I talked to my potential customers, I realized that I had to rethink the demographics. I had to rethink how would I reach out to the people who were going to be part of my demographics. And I didn't truly have a true understanding of the market. And reaching out to friends, family, and co-workers is good, but they don't necessarily represent the, the market and not even their perspectives or their level of acquaintances. So you have to really think, how do I find the people who represent the, the group that I'm interested in? And then a lot of updated thinking. I have to really take a step back in my idea and something that I think we all have to do when we have a brilliant idea. If it's not resonating with your potential customers, if they are, are giving you additional ideas, you have to think about how do I take these ideas, these new concepts, and update what I want to do and make it valid for that potential consumer. So you're really on your way now. Remember that trajectory, customer discovery, customer validation? Now you're looking at the minimum viable product. You've asked all the questions, you have a good understanding now, you've updated your thought processes, you're now thinking about building that MVP. And as Eric said, that MVP doesn't have to be a full flow product. It could be, as in my case, a paper prototype, um, it could be a PowerPoint presentation, which is what I use to discuss my ideas with. But then you have to think about that iterative cycle. So as you get more ideas, as you get more concepts, updating that MVP so it reflects that you understand it as you talk to your potential consumers. And I've got here set expectations. And these are not expectations with your bosses, your co-workers, the people you're working with. These are really your expectations about what you can do and how you can do it in that regulated environment. So I quickly learned that within that environment, I had to think carefully about my product. I had to think about um, the impact it would have on consumers. Um, I would have to think about the timelines that I had set for myself. So I had to reset my own expectations about my application and what I wanted it to do. So the barriers to success. So if you're in a regulated environment and a matrix environment, I think you'll recognize this, corporate sponsorship. So how many of you have ever taken on a project and haven't really had a strong back? Absolutely, I see a hand, a few hands at the back, great, great, great. And that's true, without corporate sponsorship, your project is not gonna succeed. And I quickly learned that I had corporate sponsors who were willing to back me, they funded my project, but it was, it was for me, an ongoing process to really let them know what I'm doing, uh, what the product was gonna be, making sure that they were fully engaged and fully involved, because without their backing and sponsorship, then I knew that I probably wasn't gonna succeed. Networking for adoption, really critical. How many times have you had meetings to discuss your product and people leave and say, great 
comes here, and within two days you get somebody come back and say, you know, so so, they said you had a lousy idea, and they want to why the fuck are you pursuing this? You have to learn to work in a matrix environment to ensure success, that people have to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the outcome will be. Forget timeline. I learned that within about three months. I have worked with a really great team of um, uh, innovators and researchers and developers, and we had set a three month timeline, and at the end of three months, I was really not where I needed to be. So forget timelines, what I've learned to do when I have a barrier is to say, okay, I have a barrier right here today, and I'm not getting what I want. What does plan B? What else can I be doing at this point in time to keep this project going? So I've given you some basic barriers to success based upon the various steps and stages with the lean startup process. But when you think about a regulated environment, when you think about the matrix environment, I think the biggest <coughs> barriers to success that you're going to have are the regulations. So quickly, you're going to have to think about legal oversight and compliance. Red is word. You have to bring in the lawyers in order to look at what you're doing. I probably around three or four months into my project, reached out to the legal team to make sure I was on sound footing. Um, we had a very candid discussion about confidentiality, and within our organization that was understood. But when you're talking about clients who potentially could be in your organization or outside of your organization, then confidentiality became an issue. Compensation was an issue. issue. Do I pay the people who are reviewing my product? Well, I was told, if you pay them, that could be an inducement. And I was told if you didn't pay them, that could be a problem too. So I was kind of stuck. <laughs> you know? Did I pay or didn't I pay? I had to navigate that and think, what would my options be? And then the question of using existing clients and customers. Did I use existing patient base within the company? And that was a discussion again that I had to have with the lawyers. I really wanted to go broad. They didn't want me to. We had to negotiate. Other things that you may hear about, specific to healthcare in particular, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And that really talks about privacy and security. So even if I even though I wasn't thinking about using customers who were who were part of our original uh, base as a as an organization, I really want to go outside of the organization, I still had to think about privacy and security. And especially as I was collecting medical history. And I recently just in work I had a conversation with somebody who's an entrepreneur and he said he's facing the same problems that as an entrepreneur and talking to regulated companies that he now has to think about HIPAA. So I'm just bringing that down to everybody, that HIPAA or in your domain regulations don't go away even if you are necessarily bound by those regulations. Medical forums. So I went to these forums and the lawyer said to me, are you providing medical advice? So that quickly became a no-no. I put out a website and they said, sure, online disclosure is good, but could this be considered to be public solicitation for the company? So do you really want to think about that? So in the end, I got really tied up with legal. So uh, that was another um, bump for me. So I would say to you, the biggest barrier potentially is going to be legal and compliance. What I had to do and what my uh, R&D team did eventually is that they went out and talked to the legal team. They explained to them what these startup represents. They explained to them the customer validation. And they explained to them the need for turnover in terms of time and responses to get your project up and running. So all in all, that represents an education of the people who will support you going forward. So I started my project around last year. Six months later, I'm still undergoing legal review for various agreements. I don't think that will ever end, but we, the conversation now is a bit smoother. I am piloting to put my application into a larger application within the company, and at that point, I want to do customer deployment again. Let's do that iterative cycle. Let's do it a lot faster than we've done in the past. And conclusion. So it's difficult and challenging to adopt lean startup principles, especially if you're a lone entrepreneur in a highly regulated matrix environment. But there's some lessons that I've learned that I'd like to share with you today. People. Don't give up on your thoughts, don't give up on your idea. When I do anything, I always think there's a way to get this done. So be bold and think outside the box. Two, think outside the corporate box. And three, legal from day one. It's important in the regulated environment to make sure that legal understands what you're doing, that they can point out to you the potential pitfalls 
and help to mitigate those pitfalls from day one. So as you go on your trajectory, as you set your goals and your timelines, you have their, their involvement. And then timelines, really, I've just given up on timelines at this point in time. I'm happy to have an application. It works because what I wanted to do, um, I'm at the point where I think that timelines actually represent something that gives you an opportunity to think when there's a barrier and um, not to get so caught up in whether or not it's a three month, six month deadline, but the fact that you're moving your project along. And at this point, I think I'm at time. I'll uh, entertain any questions. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, can you explain yeah. what your business is? Okay. Yes. Okay. So the question was, can I explain what my business is? So Optum is a subsidiary of a company called United Health Group. And there are two branches, United Healthcare, which is the insurance business, and many of you may have United Healthcare Insurance, and then Optum. Optum is a health services company. We build applications and solutions. We design programs for customers. Um, for example, um, if you need, say, um, a disease management program, we will design that. If you need some sort of technology to support um, electronic uh, records, we will design something like that. So I've designed an application that can be bolted on to other applications and put in our content. Okay. Uh, anyone else? How did you get over to that issue of So what I did is I used the marketing research team. They had an external group. Um, they were able to go out there and find people meet for me. And because they were vetted, then um, they could go out and vet the consumers. Um, they could pay them. I wasn't directly involved. And that's how I built the customer base that I finally used for my, um, for my validation. And the people I could go back to were not ongoing meeting. So that's how I kind of got around that. There was one question on the side. Sounds like you were spending a lot of time with lawyers. Um, <laughs> Doctors and lawyers, oil and water. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, did you see opportunities for the legal teams that you were working with to utilize in the principles? I think that's a very good idea. So I know that the R&D team that I started with initially worked very closely with the legal team. But I think that when you're in a very matrix environment that tends to be conservative, lean startup really is disruptive, right? And trying to get people to adopt that, change the culture, can be difficult, but I see the benefits of doing it. So I, I'm just hopeful that the word within the company will spread. I'm, I think of myself as an evangelist when I present my, when I do my updates to my uh, sponsors, I talk about the principles that I'm using. Right now, they're interested in seeing how does that iterative cycle work where you get more ideas in and you update the, your product, then you give us the data and say A and B testing. So they're engaged, and I'm just hoping that that can become an engagement that can be diffused by the company and include our legal teams. We've had a couple of lawyers talk to us during the main session, and uh, one of the key messages I said was get a lawyer to help you get to the right answer and get the yes to get you moving. How did you go about? So that's really a good question. We don't have any lawyers, we have lawyers. And so I found that it was really interesting. I'd go to one, who'd send me to another. Um, and essentially what it boils down to is getting all that legal advice, figuring out based upon what they're telling me, what's the path forward? And that's often the difficulty. So lawyers will do what they do just to advise you, but you still have to think about based upon this advice, how do I go forward without um, stumbling, without doing something that might be uh, an issue later on. So, in my case, I had multiple lawyers, and the advice that I got could differ depending upon who I was speaking with. Um, you know, do pay, don't pay. You know, I had to navigate that, and eventually, I found a company that could do the pay for me on my behalf without breaking any laws or regulations uh, from a regulated perspective. And I think when you're in a regulated environment, or when you're in a matrix environment, you're going to have the same thing. Where you'll talk to somebody, you'll get different, conflicting advice, and the question is, how do you navigate? And uh, get to where you need to be. I think there was another question. Go ahead. Uh, could you talk more about HIPAA? HIPAA. So, HIPAA, um, for many people, tends to be a bit vague, but.
essentially it was the Health Insurance Accountability and Accountability Act, and it was um, put in place in 1996. And essentially it was put in place to ensure that health information remained confidential and private, and that you have the appropriate security in place. It's evolved since then, it's a lot more complicated, but I think if you're an entrepreneur and you're building an application, the question is, if you collect medical information, how secure is that medical information going to be? You know, that's one of the things that I had to juggle with, with. Where is that medical information going to be stored? And how confidential is it? Who's going to see it? And even though I was talking to people who weren't necessarily um, our customers, um, these are random people, I still had to be aware of HIPAA as a constraint <coughs> to how I collected the information, where I stored it. And then in terms of my application, um, the kind of data it was collected, um, how is that information going to be stored, how is it going to be protected, how is it going to be secured? Um, there's a question down here. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, this is another legal question. Um, just in terms of when you're, um, when you're setting up your startup, could you just give us an indication as to the weight in terms of the percentage of, of um, revenue that you put into the legal aspect of the, the proposition? So to be clear, so this is not a startup. So Oxfam is a, um, a company, it's not a startup, it's a full-fledged, typical environment, uh, corporation. And what I've done is to try and uh, build an application in the new startup within that company. So, the discussion there is slightly different in terms of revenue, submission marks, and what that is. Okay. Can you still give an indication as to within the within the startup within right. the traditional company? Right. How much? How much? Um, uh, what what percentage would you of effort would you put into the legal side? Of oh, it? that's the, the question. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's actually a very good question. Thinking back now, and, and the. Um, and sort of the barriers that I encountered, I mean, some of them actually stopped me dead in my tracks, and a lot of them actually ended up being some of the legal questions, and um, I would have said, probably from day one, I would have spoken to legal from day one, and just get a sense from them, what they saw as issues, um, what were their constraints, and then as I start my project, navigating those in the back of my mind, the kind of things I need to think about. A lot do it the other way, which is to start the project, project and then three, four months later, talk to legal and find, oh, well, by the way, these are all the issues I need to be aware of. But I probably would have done it from day one, 100%, got their input in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's a question down here. Those who uh, want to hear more about how to navigate and uh, have any questions uh, 